Greek people share with the Vietnamese the very dubious distinction of having been chosen by American policymakers as the objects for their important experiments in the exercise of global power. Uh, so that countries which rested, after all, on very old and very rich cultural traditions were to be turned into laboratories in which American policymakers would test the infinite variety of their tactics for containment and for counter-revolution. And we are struck all the more by the arrogance of imperialism. We are struck all the more by the infinite dehumanization of imperialism when we stop to realize that until 1947, American policymakers had evinced virtually no interest in Greece. That American taxpayers who would foot the bill for the intervention into Greece and for that intervention against the uh, guerrillas in the Civil War, that those taxpayers didn't have the foggiest idea about what the political or social struggles of the Greek masses had been. And that the power of the United States suddenly appeared, very brusquely, like a kind of juggernaut, to run roughshod over the historical process in Greece and to deflect that historical process in directions that certainly did not respond to the needs of the popular classes of that country. And we ask the question, why? Why should the United States have gone in to a country in which it had shown no great interest and in which the struggles of its people were of no concern to American policymakers? Why? Well, quite obviously, there is a real question. Because when the United States went in, it went in to support, after all, a notoriously corrupt and, and repressive government. When it went into Greece, it went in to support a notoriously privileged and a notoriously parasitical ruling class. And the United States knew that because the very best witnesses of the Greek scene who were sent out by the Truman administration as observers to see what the Greek crisis was about in 1947 couldn't really abide some of the things that they saw. I'm thinking, for example, of Paul Porter. Porter, who was sent out in January of 1947 by the Truman administration to draw up a report on what might be possible in Greece, and who then went back in July of 47 as the chief of the first economic mission to Greece. And Porter was to produce his reflections in an article in Collier's magazine in September of 1947 in which he said this, from what I have seen, the government's only practical policy has been, and talking about the Greek, the government's only practical policy has been to make constant demands for foreign aid, both to keep itself in power and to safeguard the privilege of the small clique of businessmen and bankers which constitutes the invisible power in Greece. This clique has decided to defend its own interests at all costs without any concern for the possible effects on the economic health of the country. The members of this clique want to maintain a fiscal system which favors them personally to a scandalous extent. They expatriate their huge profits and have never considered investing their profits in their own country to, keep its to help its economic recovery. I still remember a sumptuous banquet in the Athens villa of one of the leading bankers. There were three liveried servants. A selection of fine wines was served with the magnificently prepared dishes. And during the conversation, the members of this clique sang the praises of life by the seaside with digressions on the beauties of the aristocratic sport. What was really horrible was the contrast between that meal and the streets of Athens where children were dying of hunger. Now you see, that is an American observer working for the Truman administration who is able to say that and who obviously sends back critical reports and so we ask why, well, is it just anti-communism? Now certainly, the, the most important policy makers in Washington had become viscerally anti-communist, had become so uh, uh, paranoid about the communist menace that even the most minuscule insurgent movement struck them as being a terrible danger, something that at a certain point could block off American opportunity and American interests in that particular part of the world. But still, that Greek democratic army, which had been formed by Marcos Vafiatis, 
was basically no real threat by March of 1947. We're talking, after all, about a small guerrilla movement, which at the end of 1946 counts no more than 7,000 armed partisans who are very poorly fed and very poorly clothed and who are really armed in the mo with the most primitive weapons and consequently are hampered on all sides, even by their own Communist Party, whose leaders don't like that particular guerrilla activity. So that the point is that the Greek Democrat Army was barely visible, operating up in the barren, mountainous northwest of Greece, and certainly not a menace at that time. So can we say that the reason then are markets? Can we say that it is the potentiality of the Greek market uh, that led the United States into that intervention of the Truman Doctrine? Well, quite obviously, American policymakers were willing and anxious to exclude the British from Greece, uh, to make the British commitments their own, uh, to open the Greek market uh, to American investments and trade. But then you must be reasonable about this that neither the slow smoldering and rather remote communist movement of Greece nor the potentiality of markets in a country as small and impoverished as Greece can really explain that kind of frenetic urgency of Truman and his advisors in March of 1947 and their frenetic decision to intervene militarily and economically in that country. We must look further. And the point is, you see, that the purpose of the Truman Doctrine was not the dominion of the United States over Greece per se, but it was the strategy of global expansionism. Or to put it more precisely, that American policymakers seized upon the pretext of the Greek crisis in order to be able to chart a course of global intervention so that American power could be deployed whenever and wherever those policymakers thought necessary in order to safeguard America's open door empire. Thus, the decision to intervene in Greece must be set into the context of the determination of American policymakers in the first instance to establish the supremacy of the United States in the Mediterranean basin and consequently in the oil-rich Middle East. Now you see, from the end of the Second World War on, the most ardent expansionists, men like James Forrestal, Truman's Secretary of the Navy, so paranoid about communism that he saw it ultimately everywhere and jumped out a window, but that Forrestal, for example, and others like him, really from 1945 on, were held bent on the demonstration of American military power in the Mediterranean basin. The deployment of American ships in that particular lake to accomplish several goals. First of all, to articulate the American assertion of supremacy in the Mediterranean, to say that the United States was and would be the primary power in that area. Secondly, to come to dominate the foreign policy and to exploit the economic opportunities of every country, whether in Europe or North Africa or the Middle East that bordered on the Mediterranean. And in the third place, to police that basin, to maintain the status quo there, to suppress whatever political or social uprising might profit the Soviet Union and might exclude American interests from that area. And then you see that from the spring of 1946, American ships began to be deployed in the Mediterranean. Uh, so that on the 10th of April of 46, uh, the battleship Missouri puts in at the port of Athens and the chargé d'affaires of that particular, uh, the American chargé d'affaires, Carl Rankin, wired to the State Department and said that the effect of the appearance of the Missouri was very salubrious because the Greek Communist Party and the Soviet Embassy in Athens both got the point. They saw that any action in terms of transforming Greece would call for a repost uh, from the United States.
A month later, it is the cruiser Helena, which once again puts in at the, the port of Athens, the 11th of May of 1946. And if you read the official naval history, you find that that expedition into the Greek harbor was considered to be salubrious because the Greek people got the idea that the United States would back a status quo within that particular country. But in the summer of 1946, the American concern over the Mediterranean and over asserting her claims in the, Amer in the Mediterranean really escalated. And it escalated within the context of a kind of minor crisis that developed in the relations between the Soviet Union and Turkey. Now we will have occasion to talk again about the contemporary history of Turkey, which is no less important for our understanding of the post-war American Imperium than the history of Greece. But it suffices to say for the moment that the Turkish Republic, as it appeared in 1945, was a reactionary and repressive regime that it was governed not so much by the bureaucrats, those state bureaucrats who had been the dominant element in the interwar decades under Kemal Ataturk, but by a very rich, emergent, and reactionary capitalist elite. That it really was a bourgeois regime of reflecting narrow commercial and industrial and financial interests. Now, nominally, Turkey had remained neutral during most of World War II, but that's only nominally, because her ruling class and the government that represented it scarcely hid their very visceral detestation of the Soviet Union and their very great admiration for Nazi Germany. Uh, so that Turkey struck an alliance uh, with Nazi Germany, a treaty friendship, uh, or a friendship treaty, uh, on the 10th of October of 1941, and under the terms of that friendship treaty, Turkey sent all kinds of strategic raw materials to Germany during the war. In 1943 and 4 alone, 90,000 tons of chrome, very vital uh, for the German war effort. In addition to that, Turkey, you see, was the guardian of the Dardanelles, and that is the gateway to the Sea of Marmara, which is itself the gateway to the Black Sea and the soft underbelly of the Soviet Union. And consequently, it is by a treaty of 1936, the Treaty of Montreux, that Turkey is given the sole guardianship over the Dardanelles to determine who will pass into those Black Sea waters and who will not. But what had happened during the war was that Article 19 of that Treaty of Montreux, which forbade any warships of a belligerent ever from passing through the straits, was broken repeatedly. That Turkey permitted German troop ships to pass into the Black Sea in order to deploy their troops against the Soviet Union. And consequently, there was anger, obviously, on the Soviet side. Now, we say that Turkey was neutral during the war, but let's not forget that she became an ally and joined the war against the Axis on the 23rd of February of 1945. Now, that was a little bit late in the game because it was pretty obvious at that point uh, that the Axis had lost. And consequently, Turkey's purpose was clear. It was that after the war, the Soviet Union's influence might be strong, uh, that communism might sweep the Balkans, that it might have an effect on the mobilization of the Turkish working classes, and consequently, uh, that Turkey wanted to strike an aid agreement uh, with the United States and Great Britain, preferably the United States, it was richer, in order to get the economic and military aid necessary in order to maintain the status quo. And so the Turks overplayed their game. And in 1945 and 46, they constantly bombarded Washington and London with stories of the fact that the Russians were on the move and they were about to be attacked. Even Washington got a little annoyed at the incessant exaggerations of the Turks until finally the Russians did something a little bit because Stalin was very circumspect about Turkey.
but in August of 1946, and for damnably good reason. Uh, because the regime in Istanbul was so anti-Soviet, and because it had permitted German warships into the Black Sea area to fight against the Russians, the Russians demanded a revision of the Treaty of Montreux regulating the Dardanelles with the proposal that now both the Soviet Union and Turkey together would regulate the affairs of the Straits and determine who entered and who did not. At that point, American policymakers freaked out and they decided uh, that the Soviet Union was placing un uh, 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 unpardonable demands upon Turkey. There never was any consideration that the Dardanelles, after all, are the canal into, Tur into Soviet national territory, and that the Soviet Union has, from any geopolitical point of view, a very legitimate concern about that. What uh, the United States did uh, was to encourage Turkey to resist any Soviet demands, which it did, and then to write a scenario which really escalates this whole Mediterranean problem to another plateau. Because by the scenario written by the State Department at the end of August of 1946, you get the first real variant of the domino theory. Because what you get in that State Department document is the concern that Russia is now interested in physically dominating not only the Straits, but Turkey. That that will lead to Russia's domination of the Middle East with all of that oil that they will be able to cut off to the Western powers. And then beyond that, that they will be able to move where? To India and to China. And consequently, thus, to eliminate those very critical markets and concerns of American capitalism. Within that context, the whole term of the Mediterranean discussion changes. It is no longer the premise of showing American naval power in the Mediterranean, but it is the principle that the United States must intervene whenever it is necessary to maintain a status quo and to maintain whatever decadent capitalist and colonial countries and regimes exist there in order to prevent the expansion of Soviet influence and Soviet domination in that area. Was it possible for American policymakers to distinguish, for example, between Soviet influence, between the bony hand of Stalin, and legitimate nationalist or socialist movements that express the indigenous will of the peoples of those particular countries? But of course not. It was impossible at any time to make that distinction. And so it is that Jeffrey, uh, Jefferson Caffrey, who is the American ambassador in France and a very important architect of the Cold War in Western Europe, Jefferson Caffrey writes to the State Department in July of 1946, and he's looking over at North Africa and at West Africa and in all of the nationalist and decolonizing movements that he sees, he sees the hand of communism, and so Jefferson Caffrey writes on the 10th of July of 1946, it would appear that communism wears a cloak of nationalism and local autonomy in North Africa and especially in Algeria. Would that it had. The Algerians would have been so better off. But it never happened that way. It was completely mythological that those nationalist movements were in any way communist inspired. But on the 15th of August, after the Caffrey message, the State Department ordered all of the cruisers of its 12th fleet, the European fleet, into the Mediterranean and sent four of them to Algerian ports in order to warn the Algerian people that they must not go communist, which meant in that term, in those terms, that they must not get their autonomy or liberation from France. Within that context, you can understand the decision to intervene in Greece. Because you must, after all, maintain that bastion. Because you must maintain that status quo. Now, Washington knew perfectly well that there was no foreign aggression in Greece. 
that saw Doris when he went to the United Nations on the 30th of November of 46 and talked about the Yugoslavs and the Bulgars and the Albanians going into Greece from the north, that that was just hogwash, that there wasn't anything there. And they also knew, and we can derive this from State Department materials, they also knew that the real cause, or the primary cause for the upset in Greece, for the fact that there was a guerrilla movement in the mountains, was the patent refusal of the Greek government to make any economic or political reforms. And Washington, toward the end of 46, kept demanding that those reforms be made. But what difference did it make if they knew all of those things? By the end of 1946, it was a fixed principle in American diplomacy and on the part of American policymakers that Greece and Turkey were bastions in the Mediterranean which could not be permitted to fall. That if they fell, if there were any change of regime, that somehow the Soviet Union would dominate the oil-rich Middle East, would then go to India, would then go to China, then to the moon, who knows? <laughs> And so within that context, we deal with something comprehensible. But American policymakers had greater designs with the Truman Doctrine than that. We talk about the imperative of establishing dominion in the Mediterranean and maintaining the status quo there. But let me say, for the commitment of the weight of the first industrial power of the world against a handful of guerrillas in the Greek mountains, American policymakers had more devious and far-reaching goals. The Greek crisis inflated grotesquely deformed into a struggle between the free world and totalitarian communism became a pretext by which American policymakers could do two very critical things. That first of all, they could finally, once and for all, insert the economies of Western Europe into the American world order. And secondly, that they could habituate and acclimatize the United States, or more precisely, the tax-paying public, to the vast commitment of intervening around the world against any revolutionary movement which threatened the interests of American capitalism. Now you see there is early in 1947 a dilemma in the expansionist strategy of the United States. There was scarcely a high-ranking official in Washington who doubted that the United States had to have that open-door empire to accommodate the prosperity and the viability of capitalism. Scarcely a policymaker who did not think that that would require a very broad and wide policing action around the world. But the problem was how to wrench the money for that from a Congress that was very eco economy-minded, and how also to animate a public that was increasingly apathetic about commitments that were <coughs> international. Now that becomes critical because by the early months of 47, American economists close to the White House were already recording that the American economy was heading for a crisis. The scenario wasn't working. Now the scenario was that Western Europe would be restored as capitalist, but not as competitive capitalist, rather as client. In other words, that it would re be restored, but would buy with American dollars the goods that were produced in the United States. Now what was happening was that by 1947, Western Europe, with the exception of West Germany, was conspicuously being reconstructed. And it was getting back to its industrial levels and even expanding them. 
but it had no dollars to spare. And consequently, that recovery was going on by ta tactics and techniques that American policymakers hated and feared. What England and West European countries were doing was striking bilateral agreements, raising tariff walls, creating uh, privileged trading zones, creating exclusive trading zones. The result being that the interior trade in the zone of England and Western Europe not only expands greatly in 1947 over what it had been in 46, but exceeds what it had been in the pre-war 1938. And at the same time, the volume of American exports to Western Europe and England declines from 1946 to 1947. Obviously, Truman's economic advisors were right that the pent-up wartime demand in the United States for goods was going to exhaust itself. And then that great industrial machine that had to sell the goods that it ground out or the rate of profit would fall, that that machine needed those European markets or God knows what might happen in the course of an American depression. The problem then was to turn that West European capitalism from a competitive one into a client and cooperative one. And that meant, after all, that they had to have in Europe dollars available in order to be able to buy American goods. That there had to be not loans, because those governments were reluctant to take loans, but there had to be outright grants of money to West European countries in order to do two things, to subsidize American exports and also to make terms so that the United States could control the interior economic policies of those countries. We're talking about that incredible enterprise in subsidized exports, in subsidized economic imperialism, which we call the Marshall Plan. And what is the connection between all of that and the Greek crisis? That that kind of handout to European countries, so that after all they will be able to buy American goods and be able to subordinate their economies to the American world order is incredibly costly. It is a vast and global enterprise. And can you go to the Congress and to the American public and say that what you're doing is subordinating European economies or creating markets? Hell no. And so the Greek crisis, because it offers the opportunity to trigger off an ideological campaign of the very first order against communism, becomes the context within which that Marshall Plan operation becomes feasible. That it is feasible and Congress will vote the money and the public will accept it only if it is phrased within terms of fortifying those countries so that they can resist communism. And what better way to prove that communism was on the march and that it was threatening the free world than to escalate out of all proportion that factor in talking about the great crisis. And you see those policymakers knew the problem that they confronted. They had already been through it at the time of the British loan. And they saw at that particular time that Congress was no, not too crazy about voting that money for Great Britain simply on the grounds of destroying the sterling bloc. But when anti-communism was mentioned, ha ha. And for the public, well, what else to appeal to but that strangely truncated, that strangely perverse moral piety of a depolitized public? And so the truth doctrine. Well, you see, until the middle of February, nobody in Washington was really excited about the Greek crisis. They knew they were going to have to go in and take it over. They knew, after all, that the Mediterranean depended upon that. 
But it was no hurry, hurry thing. It was no great crisis from that point of view. Look at the press conference that Secretary of State George Marshall gives on the 14th of February. And they ask him about the Greek crisis. And he says, oh, there are some insurgents in the hills, but no amount of aid to that Greek government is going to help unless they make reforms. But then you see it gets a little more critical on the 21st of February because then the British ambassador in Washington hands to the State Department a note saying that Britain is pulling out, that she will withdraw all economic and military support uh, to Greece and Turkey. And so there is an inevitable burden for the United States, but no. Why not turn that inevitable burden into a great opportunity? Why not make it the gateway to an expansion of American policy, to moving that expansionism to a very sophisticated and much higher plane? And that becomes the premise behind the Truman Doctrine. We have, you know, all of those early variants of the Truman Doctrine, the drafts that were written by various of Truman's advisors. And always what gets siphoned out of those drafts is anything that reveals the true purpose. Now you see, Truman himself went to Baylor University on the 6th of March of 1947, and he told what the real stuff was about, because that's an economic speech in which he's attacking all of these economic nationalist tactics in Western Europe, their tariff walls, their bilateral agreements, and so forth. But none of that makes its way into that famous speech of the 12th of March of 1947, which pronounces the Truman Doctrine. That speech is what it's supposed to be. It is vague and general and histrionic and doesn't say. Oh yes, there is a specific part. It's about Greece and Turkey. And consequently, Truman says, look, the Greek government isn't perfect. He did say that. The Greek government isn't perfect, but it is substantially democratic. And consequently, for Greece, $300 million. For Turkey, $100 million in economic and military aid. But his purposes were clearly other than that. What he was concerned about was first a free hand for American policymakers. A free hand so that any time that American interests seem to be threatened anywhere, whether in Greece or Thailand or anywhere, that there would be a free hand to intervene. And secondly, to launch and trigger that anti-communist crusade, that counterfeit crusade, if you please, which would take so many billions of victims and their aspirations, but which was so important to rally the public. And consequently, we find Truman not mentioning the Soviet Union, but alluding to it frequently, and saying the United States will support people everywhere who are resisting attempted subjugation by armed minorities or outside pressures. I will, says Truman, point bluntly, I will ask Congress in the future for new funds for other countries which must come under our protective reach in the serious course upon which we are now embarking. So globalism, both from the point of view of intervention and from the point of view of American concern, is the escalation of the Truman Doctrine and Greece the pretext for that particular articulation and enunciation. The success of the doctrine can't be underestimated because you see, in long range terms, the Truman Doctrine was the basis for incessant <coughs> intervention both military and by intelligence services to get rid of revolutionary governments or progressive movements or to buy off militants or to bump them off or whatever. And secondly, it was the basis for getting that immense commitment of the Marshall Plan of getting that incredible commitment of money in order to subsidize that foreign economic policy of the United States. In the most immediate terms, of course, it settled the hash in Greece. 
because the, the Greek and Turkish aid bill did pass. But listen, it didn't pass so quickly, did it? It passed through the Senate finally on the 22nd of April, six weeks after Truman made his rush rush speech. And it passed through the House on the 9th of May. And the first economic aid mission didn't get to Athens until the middle of July. And the first weapons don't get there until the end of August. It didn't make any difference. Truman had characterized it as an immediate crisis, and it really wasn't. There wouldn't be 25,000 partisans in the Greek Democratic Army until the end of 1947. It would take months before the weapons and the aid that the Americans sent was integrated and useful to the government army. And it would take months before American military and economic advisors really established their hegemony over the country. The point is that that wasn't really the critical factor. The importance of the rush rush of that sense of urgency was in order to seed the ground for that very large commitment of a foreign economic policy and also to begin to commit the public to that policy of anti-communism abroad and the witch hunt at home which was going to eliminate the critics of American imperialism wherever they happened to serve. <laughs> for Greece, if you think of the revolution, it is the turning point. Because from the Truman Doctrine of March of 1947 until now, the Greek people have entered their American era, in which the United States has exercised the leading authority over Greek polity, in which her policy makers have accommodated Greek politics and Greek and the Greek economy to the needs of American empire. Now it is true that the Civil War dragged on for two and a half years until October of 1949, after 158,000 had died in that struggle when the last armed partisans laid down their weapons. And that is longer than the United States had anticipated and much costlier. It began with 300 million to Greece by the beginning of 1952, the United States had sent a billion and a half dollars to that country. Well, the problem you see, you stay a little, okay. The problem you understand, it is that the Americans went in, I've seen them around the world do this, and they go in and they always make their alliances, they embrace, they love the most reactionary, anti-reformist elements in any country. They have nice times together. And consequently, American policymakers went in and struck their alliance with those elements. We're talking about the core. Oh, poor George II. So long in exile, he dropped dead on the 1st of April of 1947, just two weeks after the Truman Doctrine. And consequently, had to be replaced by his brother, King Paul, who carried into Greek politics some of the heaviest baggage it ever had had, namely his queen, Frederica. <laughs> was <laughs> not only the granddaughter of the Kaiser William II, but a leader in the Hitler Jugend. Don't search me because she's a woman. She was a leader in the, in the Hitler Jugend. And consequently, <laughs> and consequently, the idea of that court was to become an active part in politics, and it's Frederica that did that. Okay, you want to applaud because you have a queen. <laughs> and consequently, there is, <laughs> consequently, there is, in that sense, the alliance that the American embassy in Athens always strikes, after all, with that court, and which becomes a telling part of that kind of reactionary structure that Greek politics will have uh, from the time of the American intrusion on. But it's not only the court, it is that Saldaris ministry, and Saldaris recommended himself to the Americans because he was so vitriolic in his anti-communism, so determined to destroy 
destroy anything on the left. And it is that Saldaris, after all, who appointed Napoleon Sarabas, who was not only brutalized, but brutal to begin with, as his minister of public order, that Sarabas who began rounding up militants, especially in the Communist Party, with tremendous avidity, 20,000 arrested in one month of July of 1947. The problem is that ultra-reactionaries of that kind may not be very efficient counter-revolutionaries. And that Greek ruling class and that court on whom American policymakers depended were obviously so corrupt, so unwilling to make any kind of concession to the Greek people that the effort to mount a real struggle against the Liberation Army, the Greek Democratic Army, floundered. All of that money going into Greece, where did it go? Well, you know what the picture is. It's the same picture you have in Kuomintang, China, before 1949. The same picture you have in Nam Ben or Saigon at a much later time. And it is the picture, after all, of misery on the street. 100,000 Athenians out of work in 1947, and yet the ruling class riding around in late model Chryslers that they're managing to import. That economic reform, the animation of the economy, the improvement of agriculture, nothing. That the only money spent that didn't go into the pockets of the profiteers was for the establishment of military routes, of widening roads, or improving care force. And so you see the point. You have at the height of the deep Greek Democratic Army 25,000 armed partisans fighting against 136,000 in the government army with 50,000 National Guard at their side. But those who fight in the partisan army know what they're fighting for and have ideals and the others are conscripted in and are miserable. And the Americans were faulted on that. And ultimately, because it's attrition, because the American presence is heavy, because you're dealing with a lead balloon on the Greek scene, it's perfectly obvious that the war will be won by the American side. And the history of that is a dramatic history, the history of the struggle of Marcos, of Marcos Vafiatis's Democratic Army, and we have no time to steal for that. But what is interesting is just to circumscribe for a moment those factors which really operated finally in the loss of the Greek Revolution and broke the resistance. And note it well. One is that Greece was a laboratory before Vietnam was a laboratory. And the American military that went in there knew that. Van Fleet, who replaced the, the first uh, military commander, General Livesey, Van Fleet came in in the spring of 1948 and he said this is a great laboratory and what did he mean? That Greece would be the terrain on which the most sophisticated technology of counterinsurgency would be tried out. And so you have already in Greece, I tell you, that enforced movement of peasants. Three quarters of a million peasants moved out of their villages and regrouped into encampments around Greek cities so that the guerrillas could not live off the villages, so that they couldn't recruit the peasants and get the food. And so you have the beginnings of all of those defoliants. And the defoliants were used to make a desert out of northern Thessaly and out of the mountain reaches of the extreme north of Greece. And so you have the use of napalm. And napalm dropped in those planes provided by the United States by those Greek pilots, bombarding the partisans where they went. But <coughs> we have the example of Vietnam. And we know that all of that kind of warfare doesn't necessarily turn the tide. That by itself it is not sufficient. But look, the Vietnamese, after all, fought under the leadership of a communist party that not only understood guerrilla warfare and approved it, but perfected it. And that secondly, in the critical stages of that war, the Vietnamese did fight with sophisticated weapons provided by the Soviet Union and by China both. And the Greeks had no such luck 
that the heads of their party distrusted guerrilla warfare and systematically undermined it. And secondly, that Stalin not only showed his indifference to the Greek Revolution, but his outright opposition. The story of the struggle between Zahariadis and Marcos is dramatic and tragic. And it is that Zahariadis eventually ousts Marcos, even from the leadership of his own army, and then takes over that army himself and really ruins it. Because you see, Zahariadis and the Central Committee had kept the militants of the Greek party in the cities, refusing to send them off into the mountains all through the summer of 1947, while 50,000 of them were being arrested and thrown into concentration camps. And finally, by, the, by September of 47, at the famous third plenum of the Central Committee of the Greek Communist Party, Zaharyada said, we will take to the hills. But he hadn't changed tactics, because the idea then was to regroup all of those very mobile, decentralized partisan bands into one standing army, and that to take cities, and how in hell, if you cannot recruit because peasants are being regrouped into concentration camps, how in hell will 25,000 be able to fight a pitched battle with 136,000? And so that was a disaster. Zahariadis lost battle after battle and decimated that army. And all the while, Stalin. Well, Stalin had a bad press in 1947. And they all said in the American papers, you should read it for 47 for the summer, they all said that Stalin had gone revolutionary. He had reformed the common turn, it was now called the common form, the communist information organization. And there was a meeting in the summer of 1947 with the East European communist governments, Romania and Bulgaria and Yugoslavia and Poland and Czechoslovakia, and also representatives of the parties of Italy and France. And if he was reforming that common turn into the common form, wasn't he aiming to attack American imperialism? Of course not. Because the whole strategy of Stalin never changed which was to bifurcate the world, which was to divide it, after all, between the great powers. What he was doing was making a thrust at the United States by a show of solidarity to say, don't undermine our zone. At that founding meeting of the Common Forum, very conspicuously, there were no representatives of colonial countries, no representative of China, no representative of Greece, which was then fighting against American imperialism. Because the quid pro quo for that bifurcated world was that Stalin would stir nothing up in the colonial areas. And as far as Greece was concerned, he had already sold it out to Churchill. And what did he care if Churchill traded it? <laughs> and yet there were communists who wanted to help. Tito, even Dimitrov in Bulgaria, the Albanians, they were sympathetic to that Greek revolution. And finally, by the beginning of 1948, there is a little help that comes from Yugoslavia and Bulgaria and Albania, mainly from Yugoslavia. Tito, Tito fine in that. Tito very sympathetic. But then you see there is a split between Tito and Stalin. And that's when the common form blasts Tito as a renegade, a traitor, a sellout, false, phony, an agent of Costa Rican imperialism. <laughs> and that comes on the 28th of June of 1948. But before that, one of the issues that really divided Tito and Stalin was this question of Greece. Because you see, Tito and Dimitrov, the Bulgarian communists, were doing something Stalin didn't like at all. I mean, you know, satrapies are satrapies, and they're not supposed to organize themselves into independent things, despite what Ford said. Consequently, it suffices to say that when Dimitrov and Tito decided toward the end of 1947 that they would organize 
what was called a Balkan Federation, and then expanded into a Balkan Danubian Federation that would include all of the East European communist countries and Greece, that is the Greek democratic army and the provisional government it had established in the mountains. And Stalin didn't like that at all, and he convoked Dimitrov and Tito. Tito wouldn't go, he sent a representative, and they went to Moscow. You know when Stalin convoked, he went. And so they interviewed with him, as it were, on the 10th of February of 1948. And he said to the Yugoslavian representative, first of all, you must sign this paper, which is that the Yugoslavs will make no foreign policy decisions unless they clear them here. But then besides that, what is all this nonsense about Greece? There is no revolution in Greece, says Stalin. It is doomed. Nothing's going to happen with those guerrillas, and you must cease all aid. There is not only indifference of Stalin, there is an absolute opposition. Because, you see, he really thought that that Greek revolution, if it maturated, and especially since it were fighting against the United States, would, as indeed it would, place a terrible burden on his whole strategy of coexistence, even as the Cold War was evolving. But Tito didn't capitulate until he was clobbered by Stalin in June of 48. He continued to help Greece. Then after that, he really couldn't. The Yugoslavs didn't know if they were going to be invaded or not by the Soviet Union, and consequently, whatever aid there was to Greece stopped. And then, that sad event in the summer of 1949, it was at the very end of the Greek Civil War. And the government troops had really entrapped the remaining partisans up on the Yugoslav border, and Tito closed the border. And he closed the border because he thought, and I think probably legitimately, that those government fascists would come into Yugoslavia and begin disrupting the country. But what he did do was to close off the refuge of escape for those partisans, which gave, of course, the common form under Stalin, the opportunity to say in its official line for a long time that the Greek communist cause was lost because Tito had closed the frontier. But you see what happened. Caught in all of those forces, and the revolution died. And from that point on, from the beginning of 1950 until now, it is all intertwined with Esso Papas, with John Purifoy, with all of those Americans who appear at very critical moments. It's a fascinating story if you like that kind of muck. And the Greeks, Daryl said at the beginning that people pick themselves up and fight again. I say that a lot publicly. But I know privately that it's hard. And that the generation that really has been clobbered is the one that is lost. And it takes another generation that hasn't known that to begin it up again. When you fight that much and lose it, it's a disaster. But now we know about it. And at least there is some kind of sharing of it. And if they start it up again, well, then there's a lot of debt to get off our back. Huh?